Hi, I'm Ed Sof, and I'll be showing you in this DVD the techniques, exercises, and musical concepts that will enable you to play musically and to improvise musically in a jazz rhythm section. The exercises and the concepts are found in my text, Musical Time. There are some things to keep in mind, especially in the beginning. Probably the most important practical information that I can give you is that the quickest and most thorough way to learn something is to play it slowly at first so that you give your mind a chance to figure out how to play and how to practice the exercise. You must give yourself a chance to listen to what you're playing. You must give yourself a chance to think about what you're doing. Practicing slowly allows you to do that. And make sure that you read about the three paths of learning in the book. These will always help you in your learning process. And read the section about practicing and playing, because there's a lot of really good information there that will help you for as long as you welcome the challenge of learning something new. I began playing drums because I enjoyed it so much, same reason you've started playing them. And as a kid, I played a lot with recordings. You're probably doing that too. I've included a list of recordings, a discography, that represents musical timekeeping in a variety of jazz styles. You'll find that discography in the book. The drummers who are represented on those recordings are wonderful musical role models. Remember, 
the great drummers on these recordings learned the same way as you will learn and are learning now by practicing musical playing and by listening to musical players. It's that simple. It's all in the music. All you have to do is learn how to hear it. And then you'll be able to practice musical playing by using the play-along tracks that accompany the exercises in the text. Before each instructional segment, there will be a musical example that highlights what will be discussed in that segment. You just saw some close-ups of hand and foot techniques. These fundamental techniques that I'm going to show you are meant to be starting points for your own explorations. You will find out what works best for you and the music through your own musical experiences. I just want to give you now a foundation on which to get started. From a setup standpoint, the most crucial part of the set is the drummer's throne. It determines pedal techniques, it determines your posture. So what I'm going to do is give you some general guidelines. Your throne height should facilitate some basic pedal techniques that are very important for getting started. We'll start with the hi-hat. First, we've got to realize that when we play the feet, we're operating machines and our feet will only operate as well or as musically as the machines allow them to. So let me give you some pointers about how to set up your pedals, first of all. With the hi-hat, you want to make sure that you've got a nice stroke between the cymbals, a stroke that will give you a wide dynamic range. By this I mean if you have a stroke that's really small like this, which often young players do because they've come from a rock background where they use their hi-hat most of the time to be played like a drum with a stick and hardly use their foot at all, they have a very small stroke between the cymbals. So when you depress the pedals, you get a very small sound. Now that's a problem because if the rest of the kit is being played at a louder dynamic level, this won't be heard. If the rest of the kit's being played as softly as this, you're fine. But the point is, by having a stroke length this small, you severely limit the dynamic possibilities. All right, so what you do, heck, you can press it all the way down, open it all the way up, obviously. That's way too much. That's the opposite, opposite extreme. So you find the middle ground. Again, key word here is just experiment. So the idea now is that I have a stroke about like that, and that represents loud dynamics, and it represents tempos. Big stroke, slow tempos. Little stroke, fast tempos. All right? So that's the first step, is to make sure you have a nice space between the cymbals. The second step is make sure that the cymbal is not held too tightly by the clutch because that dampens the sound. Next thing you want to consider is the screw underneath the cymbal, which, which uh, determines the, the angle, all right? Because if the bottom cymbal's flat, you get an airlock. But if it's slightly tilted, then you get the nice full sound. Okay. Basic techniques with the left foot. The one that you should use for the beginning exercises in the text is called the heel-toe technique it's, or the rocking technique. We're assuming that the hi-hat's being played on two and four as it is in most jazz styles, at least the styles that we'll be studying in the book. So the way it works is that the heel is played, comes down on the heel plate on one and three and the toe depresses the cymbals and makes the sound on two and four. So it looks like this and sounds like this. One, two, three, four, one, two, 
three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. It's that simple, all right? That's your basic starting point. There's two technical variations that you have to be aware of because you want to make use of them sometimes, too. If you're playing with brushes and need a really soft sound on the hi-hat, very often it's played flat-footed, meaning that your heel doesn't come off the footboard at all. And you just play with the forward part of the foot, like this. As you can hear, that's much softer, it's more legato, smoother than this, which was the rocking technique. So what do we have so far? We have the rocking technique and the flat-footed technique. The third technique is where you utilize the whole leg. All right? This technique is often used by players at very fast tempos. It's also used by players when they want a really percussive, sharp effect out of the hi-hats. Right? And the way this technique works is that you slightly elevate your heel above the pedal. All right? And this is a good exercise just to start with. Then bounce your heel like this. Let it hit the heel board. So I'm bouncing one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four. And now the key is now is to release the forward part of the foot on the end of one and the end of three so that the foot comes down on, you guessed it, two and four, like. All right, now, that looks sort of cumbersome at that tempo. And that's what I mean about it working better at a faster tempo. If I kick the tempo up, Watch what happens. One, two, one, two, three, four. See how that bounces. Now, let me point something out that's real important that often younger players do when they're first starting out with this. When they depress the pedals with their heel up, they tighten their calf muscles, and they never release the tension in their heel. So it's always like this. And of course, it just gets tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter until you've got a cramp. It's very important that you maintain the bounce, at least from the starting standpoint. Then you're free to do whatever you want, find your own variations. But from the starting point, you want to get that bounce happening. It's like rebound in your foot, OK? That's it for the hi-hat, all right? Those basic techniques, the three basic techniques, the setup of the stroke, the clutch, and the tilter. Let's talk about tensioning the bass drum pedal. If you talk to 10 drummers, you're going to have 10 different ways of setting up the bass drum pedal, 10 ways of tensioning it. So again, what I'm going to show you is a starting point from which you can make your own discoveries. I found that I want a tension from the starting point where when I relax my foot and leg on the pedal, the pedal supports the weight. In other words, the tension is not so lax that when I relax the foot and the leg, the beater lays against the head. Because if that's the case, obviously, then my brain has to send a signal down when I want to play that says, OK, tighten up and get the beater off the head, which sounds sort of strange. And then, OK, now tighten up again and get it into the head. But if you're just in a position like this, you can always be ready to play without that unnecessary preparatory stroke. OK, let's talk now about some basic techniques on the bass drum, all right? Now, I've got a pedal here that's set up pretty much the same way as the pedal that I showed you just a minute ago. I've got a nice full stroke. When I put my foot on the pedal and relax my leg, it supports me. It doesn't fall into the head. So this is a good general setup. It's a good setup that encompasses a wide dynamic range. All right, And this is important because when we're playing the exercises in the book with the 4-4 four, four bass drum, that is quarter notes, four quarter notes per bar on the bass drum, we want to do it in such a way as it's, shall we say, felt rather than heard. It's called feathering. It's like playing the bass drum with a feather, real soft. So to do this, you want to play with your whole foot on the footboard, such as my foot is here, with your toes like right under the axle of the pedal, all right? So this makes it very easy to control a smaller stroke like this, OK? Now, watch what happens. 
That's my full stroke with this technique. That's as loud as that stroke gives me. Now, what if you do need to play louder? What if you're playing some rock or some funk and you need a louder kick? Well, here's what you do. I'm gonna have to move my left leg just a little to get some leverage here, okay. I'm going to slightly raise my heel, just like I sort of did with that hi-hat technique we talked about earlier. And did you hear the change? Coming down with the whole foot like a piston. So I've gone from this maximum stroke with my ankle. When I add the leg and slightly elevate the heel, listen to what happens. All right, so just right there, what kind of dynamic range do I have on this pedal? Now, assuming that it's set up in such a way as to accommodate these techniques, that's the first and most important step. But I have a range from here to here. All right? So that can make life a lot easier for you because if you're trying to play softly like that, you're in trouble. If you're trying to play loudly like that, you're in trouble. But if you have the technical expertise and a pedal set up to accept it, then you're in good musical shape. All right? So let's review just a bit about the bass drum pedal. Set up in such a way as you have a maximum stroke that gives you plenty of room, all right? Because that room, that stroke like represents dynamic range and represents tempo, all right? Basic techniques, first starting with heel, down. Then if you need louder, heel slightly up. And I might as well show you this too. If you really want to play loud, you stay heel up and you move down the pedal so you get more leverage. Just like if you were holding a hammer and really wanted to whack a nail, you wouldn't hold the hammer right under the head. You'd hold it at the end of the handle, all right? So when I want to really whack, so now my dynamic level has gone from that to that, all simply by changing the technique. What's the one thing that all those techniques had in common? That I let the beater come off the head. None of that. Let's talk a little bit about throne height in relation to the drums and cymbals. We need to think about distance, because that distance should allow you to play the primary areas, the ride, the snare, within the natural reach of your forearm and the length of the stick. Remember, most of the other percussion instruments, like timpani and the mallet instruments, are beneath the hands and arms of the performer, not above them. This facilitates ease of motion and minimizes the loss of energy and mobility that occurs when you keep your arms elevated above their natural level. I'm going to play now to show you some examples of how a correct setup, a setup for you, allows natural motion between the various parts of the kit. A good thing to remember is to set the drums and cymbals up to yourself, not up to them. So just a simple little motion exercise will show you how all my primary playing areas are within the natural reach of my stick and my forearm. Here we go. Pretty simple. And if you've never done that, try it. See if you can move around your drums with that kind of motion. Like if, you know, just sitting without any extraneous motion. Use your common sense. Avoid positions that cause contortions of your arms and wrists. If you have your ride cymbal way over here to the right and have to turn like that to play it, no wonder you can't play those fast tempos. No wonder you can't play smoothly. If your rack tom is way up here, no wonder it's hard for you to get from here to here. Just common sense. Avoid setups that cause tension in your shoulders and in your back muscles. Avoid a setup that forces your arms, your hands, your legs into uncomfortable and unnatural positions. And now I would like to talk about the stick grips used to play the ride cymbal and the drums. 
These ideas about stick grips are meant as a starting point for your own technical explorations. These ideas are based upon the natural shape of the hand and the fingers, and the idea that control comes from degrees of looseness, not tightness. The ride stick grip is based upon the natural shape of your hand. This is called a neutral fulcrum, one that maintains initially the natural space between the thumb and the first finger. The fulcrum, the point at which the stick is held in the hand, may change according to dynamic level, tempo, or the type of pattern being played. But what we're concerned with is the initial neutral fulcrum because it is that fulcrum that allows you to find variations that might want you to tighten up or loosen up. All right? So when I put the stick in my hand, you see that I keep the basic shape. All right? The stick does not come up here. It comes out the side of the hand. The stick goes in the first joint of the index finger, not the second, because if I roll it back into the second joint, it closes me up and everything becomes contorted. The stick gets locked in the hand. And the idea with the neutral grip is that the stick is suspended in the hand and is free to move. All right? Now, some of you will find this difficult at first. It's not difficult because it's hard. It's difficult because it's new. So don't be put off. It takes time to develop just the right amount of looseness, not tension, to hold the stick in this manner. Now, of course, if we were talking about matched grip, this is the way your other hand would look, too. All right? The same grip. So if we turn this over, we see that we are now in what is called French grip, thumb on top. The French grip, which is primarily a tympanous grip, allows great mobility of the fingers, which are real important for playing fast tempos where you have to play lots of smaller notes at faster tempos. All right? But what we're concerned with now for the exercises in the book are a stroke that come from the wrist. All right? And the wrist meaning the entire rotation of the forearm like this. Not just the wrist like that, but the entire rotation, just as though you were opening a door, turning a doorknob. All right? So this little exercise like this and then putting the stick in is a good way to get the feel for the technique. All right? So the idea here now is that if we follow the natural shape of the hand, we see that the hand naturally, the, with the way the fingers curve, they're more curved in the back of the hand, aren't they? And the front of the hand opens up. All right? So we make use of that when we're using this initial wrist grip or wrist stroke that I just showed you. Think of holding the stick back in this part of the hand and then having the thumb and forefinger just slightly in touch with it. What's called a flesh grip rather than a bone grip. All right? So that if somebody came up to you and pulled the stick out of your hand like this, there'd be no resistance or like that. In other words, we don't want a grip that would go like that. Okay? So, simple enough. The basic shape of your hand transferred to the grip. Open space, open space. Natural configuration of the fingers, tendency to hold tighter here, looser in the front, allowing the free motion of the wrist like that. Okay? When you're in this position on the ride symbol, it's called French grip. If you turn over, as is often done to play the snare, it's called German grip. What is the same in both is the fact that the neutral shape of the hand does not change. Another analogy that I like to use with this is if you try to walk with your toes scrunched up in your shoes like that, it tightens up everything, doesn't it? All right? Well, it's the same way with this. If you tighten up here, it tightens your whole arm. All right? Nice and loose allows this machine to work together fluidly, smoothly, efficiently. All right? Now, let's talk about the left hand if we play what's called traditional grip. Okay, now, what I'm going to do here is just take my hand. That's my hand tense. Now I'm going to relax it. Then I'm going to take the stick and just put it in. As with the right hand, you usually want to put the stick in about a third of the way up. All right? 
from the butt of the stick. That's a good balance point. You don't want to hold way back here, especially for the comping exercises that we're using in the book. You want to have this here so you have a nice balance point on the stick. All right, then it's simply a matter of, of taking your bottom two fingers and putting them under the stick like that so that the stick rests almost on the first joint of this finger right here. All right, it's right there, and then simply allowing the other fingers to fall on top of the stick. Notice that my thumb is not like that because as soon as I do that, I create undue tension. Again, the idea is looking for as natural a shape of the hand as when this hand does not have a stick in it. So my hand without a stick in, in traditional position looks like that. And I add the stick. The only thing that really changes is that this finger is elongated because of the stick. All right? Now, what about the stroke? Well, it's the same sort of stroke as we used in the right side. You remember we had the rotation of the whole forearm, not just the use of the wrist itself, but the whole rotation. Well, it's the same thing with traditional grip. We don't play with just the wrist because if we did, we'd play like this or like that, all right? It's a rotation of the entire forearm. So a wrist stroke would consist of this to that, this to that, entire rotation. Not this, not up and down, but keeping the arm pretty much parallel to the floor and using this rotation technique. So it's really very simple. Just follow the natural guidelines that your hands already provide you and build your grips around that. Now it's time to put the technique to musical use. We're going to use the stick grip I showed you before. And just as with the traditional grip when playing the snare, the wrist stroke is a rotation of the forearm, not an up and down motion, but a smooth lateral one. Remember, it's the same sort of motion used to turn a doorknob. It's a great way of playing the ride because in combination with the loose, natural grip that I showed you, we get maximum sound through minimal natural motion. Remember to avoid tight, restrictive, tense grips because they will hinder the smooth lateral motion necessary for this technique. Now I'm going to show you something here on the ride symbol of what I just talked about. Here is the nice natural grip and the natural stroke. Now, just so you can tell the difference, I'm going to do the same thing again with a tight, restrictive stroke. Here we go. Now, I'm going to put these two back to back so you can hear the difference in sound as well as see the difference in the stroke mechanics. Because if you can see and hear this in my playing, you can see and hear it in your own. All right, here we go. Quarter notes first with a restrictive grip, then quarter notes with a nice, loose, rotational grip that we talked about. Okay, here we go. One, two, three, four. Pretty obvious. I bet a lot of you are familiar with marching in time. If you're marching or walking in consistent quarter notes, you know that it requires consistent steps and consistent subdivided distance between those steps. So it's the same thing when you're playing consistent quarter notes on the ride or the snare. Consistent downstrokes or the steps and consistently subdivided upstrokes, the distance between the steps, in time. Here's our first and really, to me, most important exercise. You get this together and you'll have the basis for consistent time. I guarantee it. All right? And here's what we're going to do. 
We're going to count repetitive quarter notes with an eighth note tr triplet subdivision. We're going to start with the count with a pickup on three before the downbeat of one. In other words, I'm going to count like this. One, two, three, two, two, three, three, two, three, four, two, three. And if I put this in conjunction with the stick and coordinate the stick, it would be like this. Three, one, two, three, two, two, three, three, two, three, four. Up, down, two, three, two, three. So I play the downbeat, and then I stop the rebound or the upstroke of the stick in the area of the count two of the triplet. All right, let me play it again. Watch it again. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. You notice I'm not doing this. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. I'm doing this. Three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. One, two, three, one. Okay? So the idea is that when the stick hits, instead of tightening my hand, as I did in the example I just showed you a minute ago that sounded so awful and looked just as awful as it sounded, I allow the stick to slightly bounce off the cymbal like this. That's very, very important that you don't tighten your hand when you hit. And that's why this grip with the open space here is so important because it allows the stick to react to the cymbal. Here's the same idea that I just did on the ride cymbal on the snare drum, all right? So I count one, two, three, 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 Three, one, two, three, one, two, and up, three, and up. Always preparing on the third note of the eighth note triplet. Everything's in time, downstroke and upstroke. Notice that when the stick hits, I allow it to bounce a little bit. I don't go, but two, three, one, two, three, two, three. Two, three. Okay, now I'm going to pull my hi hat back in here. And I'm going to play the hands in unison. I'll play continuous unison quarter notes with my hands. And then you'll hear me add the hi hat on beats two and four. And I'll be using the rocking technique, the one that I showed you before. And then I'm going to add the bass drum playing soft quarters. And those quarter notes are going to be softer than the snare and the ride cymbal because I'm using small ankle strokes, the heels down on the foot plate, I'm keeping the beater off the head, and my full foot is on the footboard with my toes right under the axis of the pedal. You can go back and look at those techniques earlier in the DVD. All right, so here's the demo. Unison quarter notes, unison downstrokes, unison upstrokes, then I'm going to add the hi-hat, then I'm going to add the bass drum. Here we go. One, two, and uh, one, two, three, one, two, three. Here comes the hi-hat. Now I'm adding the bass drum. Okay, watch it again. And this time, I want you to count while I'm doing it. All right, I'm going to play a pickup. Three, one, two, three, one. Count along and watch how the sticks always come up on the third note of the triplet in preparation for the next downbeat, all right?
Here we go. One, two, one, two, three, 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 two, three, two, three, two, three, two, three, two, three, two, three. Okay, it's a good idea that you count like that when you play the exercise. Now, you're ready for the quarter note exercises for snare and bass. Each book section begins with guidelines to help you understand the concept being presented. Be sure to read those guidelines before playing the exercises and use the play along tracks beginning with those tracks at quarter note equals 60 for the respective 12 and 16 measure exercises. You don't have to read the exercises from beginning to end at first. You can play the measures individually before playing them in sequence and be sure to improvise your own quarter note exercises and play them along with the play along tracks too. just heard the trio play a shuffle and now we're going to do the same thing by playing the subdivisions of the quarter note that we've been counting to create a shuffle rhythm we play the third note of the eighth note triplet instead of just counting it like this one triplet two triplet one two three one two three one two So now there are two notes or a double in the place of each single quarter note. These doubles must be just as even and consistent as the singles are. In other words, our dynamic levels should not change if we switch from quarter notes to shuffle notes or double eights. This exercise will show that the doubles must be played with strokes shorter than those used to play the single quarter notes in order to be even and consistent. Here's the exercise. One, two, three, four. If I try to play the doubles with the same length stroke as the singles, it sounds like this. It's uneven. You can hear it and you can see it. All right, so one more time. Now here's the shuffle played with the appropriate shorter strokes for the doubles. I'll alternate it with a couple of measures of quarter notes. Three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, up, three, up, four, up, three. Two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two. The same stroke mechanics that you just saw on the ride cymbal hold true for the snare too. In order to play even doubles, you have to use two smaller strokes for those doubles because there are two notes now in the place of one. So here's the same exercise I just played on the ride cymbal, the alternation of quarter notes with the shuffle rhythm, played on the snare. Same stroke mechanics, same consistency. Here we go. One, two, three, four.
All right, now it's time for the unison hands shuffle exercises in section five of the book. Be sure to read the guidelines in the text and don't forget to play the shuffle exercises with just quarter notes on the ride symbol too, as well as a shuffle ride. And remember to use the rocking technique on the hi-hat and to play the bass drum heel down with rebounded strokes. Don't keep the beater against the head. As you heard in the musical example that the trio played at the beginning of this section, a backbeat on two and four was added to the shuffle rhythm on the snare. And once you can play the shuffle evenly, as we talked about, add your own accents on two and four. Now, practice section six in the book. These exercises combine quarter notes and double eights. Remember to use the two basic ride rhythms of even quarter notes and the even shuffle rhythm. We know from listening to other jazz drummers that ride rhythms are not necessarily repetitive. They may be improvised by using combinations of singles or quarter notes and doubles, parts of the shuffle. Here's an example. Our concern in this section is to be able to play combinations of singles and doubles on the ride consistently using the appropriate strokes as demonstrated in the initial shuffle exercise. We already know that playing the doubles with the same stroke length as used for the singles or the quarters will produce an uneven and unbalanced ride pattern. Watch this and listen to this. One, two, three, four. We know that the doubles must be played with two smaller strokes in order to maintain the dynamic evenness established by the singles, the quarter notes. Listen. One last time, the consistent ride pattern. One, two, three, four. Be sure to read the text in section seven before playing the exercises in both section seven and eight. With the completion of this section of the book, you have the tools necessary to master the next sections of the book until you get to single eighth note offbeat exercises in section nine. I hope that you have completed the sections prior to this one. If you haven't, please do. It will make mastering this section a lot less stressful. You'll remember how we subdivided the upstrokes of the third note of the eighth note triplet when we first played the quarter notes on the ride cymbal. Let's return to that because it will help us to learn how to coordinate the bass drum when it plays that subdivision, the third note of the eighth note triplet or the offbeat the and of the quarter note. Coordination can be thought about in two fundamental ways. How hands fall together or in unison, or how hands don't fall in unison or in a linear fashion, meaning like a sticking, left, right, left, right. So just as with the hands, same so with the feet. Hands and feet, hands and hands, feet and feet can either fall together or not fall together. They can either be in unison or linear. 
Both unison and linear relationships can be found in both the downstrokes and the upstrokes. Upstrokes have time in them too. You remember our initial quarter note exercise. One and two and three and four, three, one, two, three, one, two, up, 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 up. The upstroke was in time. Well, we're going to make use of that upstroke because that upstroke on the third beat of the triplet is right where we want to put the bass drum. So our first linear relationship is also a unison relationship because the bass drum falls with the upstroke of the ride cymbal. Let me play it for you. Just the ride and the bass drum. Here we go. One, up, two, up, three, up, four, up, one, up, two, up, three, up, four, up, one, up, two, up, three, up, four, up. All right, so did you see and did you hear how the bass drum hit with the upstroke in time. We can also coordinate the bass drum linearly with the four quarter notes played with the hi-hat. We hear two and four, and one and three are played silently with the downstroke of the heel. This produces a shuffle rhythm. What do I mean? Listen. Heel, bass, toe, bass. One, two, three, one, two, three. Heel, bass, toe, bass, heel, Bass, toe, bass, da, 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 da. Your ear doesn't realize that at first. Why? Because it doesn't put that sound with that sound or the heel sound. It hears them separately because they're so different. But in reality, what your feet are doing is simply playing a linear shuffle rhythm such as you would play with your hands. So instead of left, right, left, Right, left, right, or he heel, toe, base, heel, base, toe, base, heel, base, toe, base. If I add the sticks with that, simple linear sticking played between the feet. Only you hear only the downbeats on two and four, but one and three are there in the heel, the upbeat, just as the upbeat was here in the ride cymbal stroke. Okay, for initial practice, you want to play your quarters on the ride, your hi-hat on two and four, and you want to vocalize the bass drum's triplet partial, that third note of the triplet. Think about those relationships that we talked about. And if you can say it, you can play it. Here's a demo. I should point something else out to you, and you've probably already figured it out. I'm already playing unisons between my right hand and my left foot. Four quarter notes here, you just hear them on two and four. Four quarter notes here, all of which you hear. One, two, three. Now, I'm going to think about the bass drum. I'm going to sing it. Boom, 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 boom. I can do that because I've practiced it. Now, probably the first time you try this, it's going to be a little difficult. But remember what we said. When you can't play something, it's not because it's difficult or hard. It's because it's new. And your mind has to find out how to figure it out. I've given you the tools to do that. Think about the relationships. What falls together? Unison. What doesn't fall together? Linear. Once your mind works those pathways out, the coordination will fall right into place. And remember, too, practice slowly. How slow? Slow enough that you can think about each note before you play it. Now, read the text in section 9 and play the exercises. Remember, you don't have to play the complete exercise right off. Take your time and play each individual measure a few times. Do it with the tracks. The tracks last long enough, and if you misread, if you make a reading mistake, but if you play it in time, it's an improvisation. So don't stop playing. 
If you're on the bandstand and playing and you think you make a mistake, you can't stop the band and say, hey, can we start over, guys? I just made a mistake. You have to keep playing. So you want to practice that way. You want to practice the way you want to play on the bandstand. Don't develop the bad habit of stopping whenever you've made a reading mistake. Welcome to the real world of comping or accompanying. The exercises in this section are realistic comping figures. But remember, these are only exercises used to develop the musical coordination skills for you to create comping figures based upon your interpretation of the tune that you are playing. These music-based comping figures that you hear can come from specific rhythmic motifs or patterns that are actually part of the tune or from the response to a riff. And a riff is a repetitive pattern played as part of the melody. Or it can come from your response to something that the soloist plays, or your response to spaces that the soloist leaves in his solo, or simply can be your response as to how you hear the tune and how you decide to delineate the form. Then. It could be combinations of all of the above. That's the fun of making music. But you can take advantage of all of these options that are available to you as a listening musician if you have the coordination skills necessary to play those comping figures that you want to create. And that's what these exercises will do for you. When you sing the melody, when you know the melody of the tune, you will have the musical tools to accompany the other musicians in a musical way. So. Read the text in section 10 and have some big fun playing the exercises with the tracks. You'll be amazed at how you really sound like part of the rhythm section, because you are. Our next subject is accent technique. By using accents, we can create phrases, excitement, and rhythmic interest, just as the other instruments in the rhythm section do, and just as horn players do, too. So let's go back to the trio so you can hear what accents are about in a comping situation. In this first example, the drummer thinks that you get accents by hitting the notes to be accented harder. Now, listen to what it sounds like if the accent technique is based upon the idea that the loudest level of the snare or bass drum is the accent level. And so, to make any of those notes sound accented, we have to play softer notes around them. Watch and listen. The difference is pretty obvious, isn't it? The overplayed notes in the first example sound out of time because they are out of time. And there's no dynamic balance within the drum set. So why does it sound better when accents are achieved by playing other notes softer than the balance level? Well, 
It's because that's how the pianist does it, and it's how the bassist does it. One of the essential ingredients of musical time is dynamic consistency. You can hear it. The dynamic level is the accent level. Thus, accents can be soft or loud, depending upon the dynamic level of the rhythm section. The balance level, the dynamic level, is the accent level. To make notes sound accented, you don't hit them harder. You put softer notes around them. This concept is discussed in section 11 of the text. Please read it and practice the basic exercises. When I first started playing this type of music and was studying it, studying the same basic exercises that you're studying now, I always thought that independence just had to do with rhythms. But what I've discovered is that independence also has to do with dynamics. I'm going to demonstrate now dynamic independence while playing dependent or unison rhythms. This is an aspect of independence that is often overlooked. The object is to maintain the even quarters of the ride cymbal in this instance while playing accent patterns with unison quarter notes on the snare. The ride cymbal represents the dynamic consistency of the bass player's rhythmic and melodic patterns. The snare represents the comping of the pianist or the guitarist. The ride represents the balance level that we spoke of in the previous segment on accent techniques. This is discussed further in section 12. The initial exercise involves playing consistent quarters on the ride while playing groups of balanced and softer quarters on the snare. Here's an example. I'm going to play, first of all, even quarter notes on the ride cymbal. Here we go. One, two, three, four. How do I know they're even? Because not only is the downstroke in time, but the upstroke is in time, too. The silent part of the stroke is the important part. So we must always pay attention to that. But I know you're doing that because we've been doing it all through the book. Here we go. One, a two, a three, a four. To that, I'm going to add dynamically balanced quarter notes on the snare. All right, so the idea is to start with the same dynamic level in both hands. So let me see if I can get that going. Here we go. One, two, three, four. All right. Now, we know that if I want to accent some of those quarter notes on the snare, I don't use a larger stroke. What do I do? I play softer notes, softer quarter notes, to make whatever note I want to sound accented sound louder. So here's an example with just the left hand. I'm going to start out with even quarters at the balance level, the dynamic balance level that we've talked about. And then I'm going to play some notes softer. And before your very eyes and ears, you're going to hear an accent pattern. Here we go. All right. Now the idea is, is to be able to do that, to change stroke lengths with a unison rhythm while maintaining the same stroke length in the right hand. The bass line, all those quarter notes, when you heard John play them, all even. The quarter notes on my ride, the same way. Over here, this is Stefan, the pianist. Some of his notes are at the balance level, some are softer. That gives the impression that he's accenting in his comping figures. That's what we want to be able to do on the drum set. So our initial exercise is a very simple one. When you're working with complex concepts, it's important to use simple rhythms, not complex rhythms. Again, slowly think, listen, and watch what you're doing. Here we go. I'll start with the ride. I'll add the even left hand, and then I'll go into the accent pattern. Watch my right hand, and notice how it remains the same, even though my left hand starts playing combinations of larger and smaller strokes, balanced strokes, softer strokes. Here we go. One, two, three. Four.
you see it? And you heard it. Now, just so you have a reference point, I'm going to play dependent rhythms, but instead of playing independently in terms of dynamics or strokes like I just did, I'm going to let my strokes be dependent too. So that when I get soft in my left hand, I'm going to get soft in my right hand. Three, four. Sounds a lot different. It doesn't have any flow anymore. Imagine if a bass player played the way I was playing there. You wouldn't be able to ever establish a groove because that essential ingredient that we talked about earlier, dynamic consistency, the dynamic framework, isn't there. But... <laughs> sounds a lot different, sounds a lot better. Work on it. Practice each appendage separately at first. Find an accent pattern that's comfortable in the left hand. Work with it so that you don't have to think about it anymore. And then put them together slowly. Look, listen, and feel what it feels like to play it. Once you're comfortable with this, follow the directions in the text and devise your own accent exercises using previous exercises, starting with, of course, the quarter notes. Don't start with anything else until you can do it with quarter notes. I strongly recommend, as I do throughout the book, that if you aren't doing it already, that you should improvise your own comping patterns with the play-along tracks. That's when the real fun begins. I hope you've gotten a lot out of this. I've certainly enjoyed working with you, and I hope to see you again. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.
want to tell you a little bit about the gear I use, the cymbals and the drums. I'll start with the drums. These are Yamaha. They're Birch Custom Absolutes. I've been with Yamaha about 20 years and obviously like their drums. This kit is what's called a jazz kit because of the small sizes made for combos. And the sizes are 10, 12 rack toms, and 14 by 14 floor. The bass drum is an 18-inch kick. My snare drum is a custom-made drum that they made for me at Houston Percussion to my specifications. I like a real crisp sound, but with depth, and that's why I use this drum. My cymbals are all Zildjian's, and I've been playing Zildjian probably longer than I want to tell you, but I've been playing them a long time. These are 13-inch Ks, and this, the way this setup is, it's got a regular K top, but on the bottom, I have what's called a brilliant finish. And uh, this gives me a really nice, sharp chick sound. The ride symbol here is a relatively new Constantinople. Uh, it's a 20, medium, thin, high pitch. Beautiful symbol. This is a 22, same type of symbol, medium, thin, high pitch. Lots of good stick definition, but nice warmth underneath. Right, and the overtone series never build up over the stick sound. Real important thing to look for in a ride cymbal. Over here, to, as sort of a contrast to the warmth and depth of these cymbals, I have what's called a flat ride. Doesn't have any cup on it at all. And this is a custom dark ride made by Zildjian, 20 inch. So it has a lot of stick sound and very little overtone because it doesn't have a cup, and doesn't have any shoulder. You'll notice that in this cymbal I've put rivets just to add another dimension to the sound so that when I hit it, it sizzles, okay? That's pretty much my cymbals. That's pretty much my drums. The only thing left, really, are the heads. And heads are very important because without good heads, you don't get a good sound. I use Evans heads. For my toms, I use coated Genera G1s on all the toms. And on the bottom, I use clear Generas because they're nice and resonant. On the snare, for this video shoot, I've been using a Genera, and that head has a sound control ring in it to take out some of the overtones, and I use that here because of the nature of the recording. If I were in a live situation, playing in a club or concert, I'd use a Genera G1, which is similar to the head that's on the floor tom. So that's my gear. I'm very happy with it, and I hope you enjoyed listening to it. My sticks are made by Innovative Percussion. I gave them some designs to work with, and they came up with the Ed Soap model. It comes in two wood types, maple and hickory. The hickory is for louder situations, good for funk, good for big band. The maple, good for combos, like the trios that we were playing with today. In any case, it's a very versatile stick, well-balanced, and feels great in the hand. I noticed when we were setting up that you took a lot of time in tuning the heads yep. and tuning the drums. Yes. What would you like to tell well, us? Well, I studied timpani when I was a young man and developed a real mania for pitch. And I like my heads to have a definite pitch. So when I tune, there's either a major or a minor intervallic relationship between the drums. And the main thing is that I like to have the head in tune with itself. Not only does it sound better, but it also responds better to the stick. And by being in tune with itself, it means that if you go around to each one of the tuning points on the instrument and you hit it, it should be pretty close to the same pitch. Likewise with the bottom head. The common question is, well, what do you do with the bottom heads on your toms? Higher, lower? got me. I do it both ways. Sometimes they're the same pitch, sometimes they're lower. I usually don't tune the bottom heads higher because they, then they don't respond as well vibrationally with the top head. So the basic thing is that I simply like the head to be in tune with itself so that it gives a nice sound just like the other instruments are in tune with themselves. Ed, when we were setting up before the shoot, you were very uh, conscious of where you wanted the bass, where you wanted the drums. 
Uh, how does that affect your playing? Well, it's not how it affects my playing, it's how it might affect the other people's playing, okay? I like the bass player here because I can hear him better, but also because I want him to have full exposure to my bass line up here, my quarter note, because that's what he's going to lock in with, just like I'm locking in with his. So that's where our relationship is, is cemented, is right there. As far as the pianist goes, I want to make visual contact, want to be able to look up and have him look at me so that we can give signals back and forth if we were in an actual playing situation where he might give me a cue that we were going to a part of the tune, say if you had an open section where he was soloing over a vamp and he wanted to leave that section, he'd look at me to give me a cue. Likewise with the bass, I can see the bassist's hands, I can see the bassist's face, and the same sight lines are available to them so that we can communicate not only with our ears but with our eyes if necessary. From the standpoint of just basic rhythm section setup, this is the same sort of setup we would use in a big band. The case being here is that the hi-hat would be in the band, which is very crucial for a lot of horn players to hear that hi-hat. So in general, this is a basic rhythm section setup that can either be used in a small group situation like this or then taken into the big band situation.